Hey guys, welcome to another episode on TFB TV. Behind me here is Doi Sutep, one of the biggest mountains that is closest to Chiang Mai in Thailand. Unfortunately, it's pretty cloudy out today and I can't really show you much of the mountain or else I would be showing you a little bit of it. It's a pretty cool mountainscape here. Today we're going to be talking about the rod bayonet in American small arms military history uh, with the Hall rifle, with the early Springfield 03s and a couple other interesting examples there. I want to really give a big shout out to Alex McKenzie at Springfield Armory National Historic Site in Springfield, Massachusetts. Thank you very much for helping us out with filming this kind of stuff. In addition, I really want to thank Venture Munitions as well. They're a really big sponsor, really big helper and you'll help us get this sort of stuff to you. Thank you very much and once again if you're in Thailand I want to hear from you. All right enjoy the episode. A lot of people ask about that. Uh, yeah, a lot of people who collect 1903s um, will read about early configurations that included a rod bayonet and one of those big questions is why? Mm -hmm. Why is this a thing? Yeah. Where did this come from? What's the big deal? And it really starts about oh 80 years before uh, with the uh, Hall rifle. Okay. And uh, so let's see where this all began. Yeah. And so here is a Hall, an 1833 Hall made by uh, Simeon North in Middletown, Connecticut, right down the road. Okay. Um, and they were uh, actually Simeon North was making these for the militia. Yeah. And uh, part of the design on these later um, percussion uh, Hall rifles was an integrated bayonet. So before we go any further, let's talk about what exactly is a rod bayonet, so our yeah. viewers understand. So explain to us, bare bones, what's a rod, what's a rod bayonet? So basically, a rod bayonet is a slightly different shape. That's the modern stuff we'll see in a little bit, where it's uh, more uh, circular. But uh, people can use it generically to refer to a bayonet that's kind of integrated into uh, a, a rifle or a musket itself. Okay. And so the, the idea here was it saves you um, space on your belt, saves weight. Um, if you have another way to use uh, your cleaning rod or clean it, um, then uh, you, can ha you reuse that space uh, for a bayonet. And pretty much it just stayed right under the uh, barrel until you were ready to use it when you just work it up like so and it clicks eventually eventually maybe this or one maybe on the not. hall oh it clicks way down there there <laughs> is where it clicks this so thing. there's your hall bayonet yeah it's, it's, um it's huge <laughs> it's, it's a monstrosity yeah but it's it's mimicking that uh, uh triangular bayonet um and uh that would be a traditional musket uh, bayonet, socket bayonet, mm -hmm. um, and uh, it was an idea. Really didn't catch on. Um, the hall itself as a design was neat, uh, but really, you know, it leaked gas, didn't work very well, so the idea um, for an integrated bayonet kind of died with the hall. Kay. And the hall went out, mm -hmm. you know, by, well, before the Civil War. And so that's when that just kind of festered. Yeah. But the integrated uh, bayonet ends up coming back uh, in the after the Civil War. So really, the next time it it, it comes out is post Civil War when we've adopted another breech loader. The idea kind of resurfaces. Okay. Uh, so one of the armory's bigger inventions uh, after the Civil War is the trapdoor. The trapdoor Springfield. Yeah. And as you can see here on this one, which is a experimental model 1880. Uh, you see the return of a triangular integrated bayonet. Yeah. And that one's a little shorter before it locks in, which is kind of nice. It has almost the same uh, uh, mechanism for retention that the hull uh, does. does. I mean, there, you know, there's nothing new under the sun. There's true everywhere in this uh, collection. But yeah. um, so this is 1880, purely experimental. They're playing around with all sorts of other ideas too, um, but the uh, but this uh, bayonet makes its appearance, and uh, but it doesn't gain any traction. This stays a an experimental, and uh, um, part of that is uh, they had tons of socket bayonets around, tons, and literally so, the whole Civil War's worth of bayonets. Like yes, <laughs> and so there was no real incentive to move on from a socket. Okay, and uh, but they tried again later on this is a later experiment, but um, effectively this is the first appearance around 1888 or so of a rod bayonet. So mm -hmm. instead of that triangular shape, 
we get. Uh, this one doesn't want to come out, but oh, there it goes. Yeesh. A more cylindrical. Uh, the tip kind of looks like a Phillips head screwdriver mm -hmm. a little bit. Literally a rod. But, uh, but literally a rod. Yeah. And so one of the big things that had happened here is um, they developed a good breakdown cleaning rod that would go in uh, uh, your butt stock. And so, um, so that kind of freed up space underneath the barrel. Okay. Um, and so they could play with the idea of a rod bayonet again. And, the, and again, to, to reinforce why were they doing this, one of the main missions of, of ordnance was to try and figure out ways to decrease the weight of a, of a given soldier that they're carrying around. You know, less things to carry, you know, they, they can carry more ammo or, or replace things like that. Who knows? But bottom line was this is a lot lighter than your regular bayonets you're carrying on your belt. And uh, um, so this uh, made an appearance in the late 1880s, but that also coincides with smokeless powder. And actually, this particular trapdoor is neat because it is in 30 cal, and it's smokeless. Not 30 out six, though. Correct. Okay. Yeah, we hadn't gotten there yet. This is about 1892 or so. And for those who know um, the kind of evolution of U.S. military small arms, the one rifle uh, design that uh, that was adopted uh, the is the Krag. Yeah. The Krag Jorgensen. This one's cool because it's number one. <laughs> this is serial number one. This is serial number one hmm. of the Krag. And uh, uh, foreign design, uh, one of the first uh, times that happened where it wasn't invented in-house or developed in-house. Um, but the interesting thing is the Krag design as basically a canned system it already included a knife bayonet. So the bayonet decision was kind of already made by virtue of just choosing the Krag Jorgensen design. Yeah. And uh, so away goes the rod bayonet with all the other experimentals and we move forward with a, a knife bayonet with a Krag. Until we get to the Springfield. You got right. it. So, of course, the Krag performs less than stellar um, in the Spanish-American War, and, and that Spanish Mauser uh, proved uh, uh, a far better design. And so there was a total overhaul in, uh, in U.S. rifle uh, design or the thoughts that they were putting into it. And you know, swipe a few ideas from, from Mauser and yeah. integrate them uh, into uh, a new and improved design. And we've got some of those prototypes here. So here is a model 1901, still experimental, very much a Mauser action. Uh, still got that length, but look what our friend has. It's a rod bayonet. Yeah. So they're still making crags here off the line. They're still issuing crags as regular service rifles, but the experimental department here is trying to make this new and improved rifle. Okay. Uh, and uh, so this is, again, 1901. These were issued for field trials. And uh, um, our rod bayonet comes back. And I'm not sure exactly why that is, but there's usually a, a common thread of uh, um, particular ordnance officers being in charge at a given time. Mm -hmm. uh, there was one named uh, Adelbert Buffington, uh, who, when the uh, rod bayonet and uh, integrated bayonets first made their appearances on the trapdoor, he was commanding officer here at Springfield Armory. So in a position of power, decision maker when the rod bayonet reappears in 1900 1901 he is now chief of ordnance and so you know i think that's a strange coincidence you know it seems like he's in a position to make these decisions and say we're going back to the rod bayonet so it could be that could be something else but the rod bayonet just keeps coming back it's formally adopted in 1903 and so this is what an original 1903 looked like when it was made, when it was first adopted. And so lots of neat stuff going on down here. Uh, but, uh, but the focus here is our friend, the rod, the rod bayonet. bayonet. Here again. And so it made it into the final version. Yeah, isn't it? Look at that. It's so short. You can actually take the whole thing out at this yeah, point. Another one, they're, they're somewhat captive, yeah. I think. 
Mm. And uh, uh, so the first, you know, 70,000 or so 1903s off the line were in this configuration. Not long after, uh, people start to realize, hey, wait a minute, there's some, there's some drawbacks to this uh, uh, setup with the rod bayonet. So one of those is, you know, as we noted, it's thin. It's very, it can be very flimsy at times. It can. And uh, uh, it actually uh, was so flimsy, it, it caught the attention of the president. The <laughs> president of the United States. That's correct. Yeah. Who at the time was one Theodore. Teddy. Ted <laughs> Roosevelt. And he sent a letter, January of 1904. Here's the letter, which is kind of neat, out of our archives here on White House stationery, where he's saying uh, to the Secretary of War, I must say that I think that ramrod bayonet about as poor an invention as I ever saw. <laughs> as you observed, it broke short off as soon as hit with even moderate violence. It would have no moral effect, I think he means morale effect, yeah. uh, and mighty little physical effect. I think the suggestion of a short triangular bayonet is a great improvement. After you have gone over this subject of the bayonet, do take it up with me. <laughs> this is the president of the United States yeah. saying, "Look, guys, this bayonet sucks. Yeah. Uh, you need something better." Like that's yeah, that's pre that's pretty bad criticism at that point. <laughs> it is. You know? I mean, but it's not just the president of the United States. It's Teddy Roosevelt yeah. who's saying that. Uh, and so, so what, what would you imagine happened? Springfield Armory, you know, this goes from the, sec from the president to the Secretary of War to the Chief of Ordnance and then works its way down here to Springfield and then everybody just snaps into action. Yeah. Uh, they move fast. So what comes out of that, though? Well, they start analyzing different things. They're like, all right, what are our options for, the, uh, for bayonets? Uh, how does it work? The Krag had a knife bayonet. How do we, you know, deal with that? Um, or if the idea of... You know, what happens if the, the rod bayonet idea is good in theory, but we just need to make it a little more beefy. Yeah. And so um, here's one of the experimentals that they did where they just really increased the size um, and strength of the rod bayonet. Yeah. So it's uh, four flutes and uh, um, a lot more substantial and they improved, they looked at ways of mounting this thing under so it could stand up under stress um, and uh, uh, have a little bit more substance to it. Yeah. <laughs> they started uh, uh, that aspect of it almost immediately um, and also started trying out knife bayonets. One of the big things they found, uh, uh, probably in addition to the weight issue, um, was that when these integrated bayonets, rod or triangular or um, four-sided, um, when they get bent even slightly, they get right in the path. Of the bullet. You got it. Yeah. And so that's a problem. And if they get bent, you can't get them back in. You have to discard it. Right. Essentially. So having a mechanism where you've got a knife, which has got other uses besides being a bayonet, where you put it on when you need it, and you take it off and put it away when you don't, um, you're not going to uh, uh, have uh, the issues that you would with, a, with an integrated bayonet. So while the idea was entertained to have a beefier um, uh, rod bayonet, uh, they ultimately abandoned it, and they went back to the design uh, that they had done with the crag um, and uh, said, all right, uh, basically, they, they put a, a crag upper band and, and bayonet um, uh, lug onto it and, and said, all right, we're going to um, have this as a basis, which is why actually today a crag bayonet will fit on an 03. It'll fit on an M1. Um, and a lot of this is because of this moment we're talking about now, the demise of the rod bayonet. Which is what we have right here. And so, so this is...